Section 12 of Magna Carta Commemoration Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Casper. The Influence of the Magna Carta on American Constitutional Development by H. D. Hazeltine. Part 1. For seven centuries, Magna Carta has exerted a powerful influence upon constitutional and legal development. During the first four centuries after 1215, this influence was confined to England and the British Isles. With the growth of the British Empire during the last 300 years, the principles of the Charter have spread to many of the political communities which have derived their constitutional and legal systems from England and which have owed in the past, or which still owe, allegiance to the mother country. The earliest, and perhaps the most important phase of this imperial history of Magna Carta, is its effect upon the constitutions and laws of the American colonies, and of the federal union that was established after their war of independence. In this story of the Charter's influence upon American constitutional development, three separate periods should be distinguished. The colonial period, which began with the granting of the first Virginia Charter by James I in 1606, and which ended about 1760, was followed by the epoch of the American Revolution. With the Treaty of Paris in 1783, in which Great Britain acknowledged her former colonies to be free, sovereign, and independent states, the present period of national existence had its definite beginnings. Each one of these periods is closely related to earlier events and ideas in the history of England and of the colonies. Together, the three periods constitute American constitutional and legal evolution as a whole. But this American evolution is one that rests for its foundation upon the long centuries of English development that preceded its own beginnings, and that bears also, in a marked degree, the imprint of constitutional and legal changes in England during the period of colonization and even in later times. Indeed, rightly to understand the constitutional and legal history of the colonies and of the United States of America, in each period of which Magna Carta plays a role, we should not forget that the Englishmen who settled in America in the 17th century inherited all the preceding ages of English history. To them belonged Magna Carta and the common law. To them belonged the institutions and ideas that were inextricably bound up with Magna Carta and the common law. To them belonged the legal traditions of the Tudor age, the age that immediately preceded the period of colonization. The colonies did not fail to enter upon their inheritance, and the result has been that colonial institutions and principles, both of public and of private law, retained much of the Tudor and the pre-Tudor tradition, and that even today American institutions and principles bear the impress of its influence. For England, the 17th century was the first great age of the empire, the age of commercial and colonial expansion, not only in the West but in the East, and it was the age also of the momentous struggle at home between the crown and parliament, between the claims of royal prerogative and of parliamentary supremacy. In America, the century was preeminently the age of settlement and the growth of chartered colonies, either of proprietary or corporate character, this American development constituting one phase of English expansion, and it was likewise the age in which the results of constitutional conflict in England exerted their first influences upon the development of the colonial institutions and of colonial legal and political ideas. The growth of the colonies in America meant from the very beginning the extension of English institutions and laws to these little Englands across the sea. To their birthright of the English traditions of the 16th and earlier centuries was now added the gift of the constitutional and legal principles established in 17th century England 
the England of Stuart kings, of Commonwealth and Protectorate, of Revolution. For the changes in the public and private law of England during the century directly and vitally affected constitutional and legal growth in the colonies. As the common law emerged at the end of the century, enriched by judicial decisions and constitutional enactments, the fundamental principles which they embodied were added to the common law heritage of Englishmen in the colonies. Thus, like Magna Carta itself, the great constitutional documents of the 17th century, such as the Petition of Right, the Habeas Corpus Act, and the Bill of Rights, have a colonial as well as a purely English history. To these statutes, as to Magna Carta, the colonists turned as the documentary evidence of the fundamental rights and liberties of all Englishmen, whether they resided in the homeland or in the English communities of America. Perhaps the most important feature of American history before the revolutionary epoch was the gradual transition from chartered colonies to royal provinces, and owing to British colonial and commercial policy of the times, the tightening of imperial control through crown and parliamentary agencies. Although the constitutional changes in England during the 18th century, including the further development of parliamentary sovereignty, vitally affected the relationship between the colonies and the home country, yet they failed to influence in any marked degree purely colonial constitutional development. Footnote. Lowell, Government of England, Volume 2, page 472, expresses this forcibly when he says, American institutions are still, in some respects, singularly like those of England at the death of Queen Anne. Thereafter, the changes in the British Constitution found no echo on the other side of the Atlantic, largely no doubt because, taking the form of custom, not of statute, they were not readily observed. End footnote. From the early 18th century down to the present day, American institutions have developed in the main along their own lines, largely upon the basis of English development in the 17th and earlier centuries, colonial development in the 17th century, and American political thought and constructive statesmanship of the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries. This striking divergence of American from English institutions, dating from the early 18th century, is in sharp contrast with the history of the law. Throughout the 18th century, though perhaps less in the period of the Revolution, English common law continued to influence the development of colonial legislation and judicial decisions, and even today the American system of common law and equity is, in its fundamental characteristics, the same as that of England. So, too, in certain leading features of constitutional law, as distinct from constitutional institutions, such as the American system of three coordinate departments of government and the power of the judicature to declare an act of the legislature null and void because in conflict with the written constitution, we see a striking persistence of English principles. Rights and liberties of Englishmen embodied in Magna Carta, the Bill of Rights, and other constitutional documents became vital features of colonial constitutional law, and have continued, throughout the revolutionary and national epochs, to the present day, to be essential elements of American constitutional law. The story of the influence of Magna Carta on American constitutional development is but one phase of the whole history of English institutions and law in America, and this, in turn, is but one chapter in the history of a broader, a further-reaching development, the extension of English laws and of English common and statutory law to the many political communities that have formed or still form parts of the British Empire. In studying Magna Carta in America, we are concerned, therefore, with one feature, and one only, of this whole vast process. But just as the influence of Magna Carta in England itself cannot be understood apart from the long history of the ever-changing body of rules and principles that go to make up the system of English common law, 
of which the provisions of Magna Carta form only a part. So, too, an understanding of the influence of Magna Carta in America can only be reached by considering this great legal document as but one of the many sources of English common law in its American environment. In the present paper, certain main features of the American development throughout its three periods will be suggested, but without any attempt at exhaustive consideration. Part 1. 1. From the very beginning, the colonists claimed that they were entitled as Englishmen to the law of Englishmen, the common law, as a great corpus juris, based on the decisions of the courts and on the statutory enactments of Parliament, a body of the rules of private and public law which secured to Englishmen their rights as private individuals in their relations, one with another, and also their rights and liberties as subjects of the crown. It was this common law of England which the various colonies, acting through their executive, legislature, and judicature, adopted or received, either partially or wholly, as the law adapted to the needs of English communities in America. Along with the English law thus received by the colonists, there grew up in the various American communities new rules and principles based on colonial customs the reformative skill of colonial lawmakers, and, in the Puritan colonies of New England, natural or divine law. Footnote. In claiming the common law as their own, the colonists were but applying Coke's doctrine that the law and custom of England is the inheritance of the subject. End footnote. If, for the moment, we view the whole system of English common law, as partly public and partly private law, even though English legal thought does not draw a sharp distinction between the two, we may the more easily grasp the early attitude of the colonists towards the law of the homeland. Reinch has expressed this attitude in these words. English colonists, in their general ideas of justice and right, brought with them the fruits of the struggle for law in England most of the colonies made their earliest appeal to the common law in its character as a monument of English liberty, that is, considering more its public than its private law elements. Footnote. Hallam, Constitutional History of England, Volume 3, 1906, page 338. In quitting the soil of England to settle new colonies, Englishmen never renounced her freedom such being the noble principle of English colonization, circumstances favored the early development of colonial liberties. End footnote. Or, in Channing's phrase, so far as the English common law protected them from the English government and from royal officials, they looked upon it as their birthright. So far as it interfered with their development, it was to be disregarded. If we bear this fact in mind, we shall see more clearly that English constitutional statutes and cases were, as their birthright, of fundamental importance to the English colonists of America in their struggles with colonial and imperial authorities. In the earlier Stuart reigns, Magna Carta, as the greatest of all English statutes of liberty, was regarded by the colonists as a bulwark of their rights as Englishmen. As the 17th century advanced, the great constitutional struggles in England were reflected in the colonies, and the Petition of Right, the Habeas Corpus Act, the Bill of Rights, and the Act of Settlement, 1701, took their place beside Magna Carta in the minds of the colonists as statutory guarantees of the rights of Englishmen, both at home and away from home, in respect of life, liberty, and property. It is for this reason that we must view Magna Carta, in its history in the colonies, as only part, though a most valuable part, of the whole body of English constitutional law, the common law in its character of public rather than private law, and the common law as it is found in constitutional cases and constitutional statutes. As Englishmen, owing allegiance to the crown and settling upon land claimed by England as under its sovereignty, the colonists were, it would seem, entitled to the rights of Englishmen, embodied in Magna Carta and other sources of common law, 
without further sanction of royal charter or colonial legislation. But not only did royal charters to the colonists secure these constitutional rights, they were incorporated also in colonial legislation. 2. The granting of the first Virginia Charter by James I in 1606 marks the real beginning of English settlement in America and the opening of a new era in the history of colonization in general. In this famous document, the final form of which was in part the work of Coke himself, the king not only claimed the right to colonize a large portion of the territory of the New World, but he asserted the principle that English colonists in this territory were to enjoy the same constitutional rights possessed by Englishmen in the homeland. This principle had been embodied in the Elizabethan patents to Gilbert and Raleigh, but the colonizing experiments of these adventurers under the Queen's authority had produced no permanent results, and it was not until after James's patent to the Virginia Company that the principle first took root in American soil. Also we do, reads James's charter, for us, our heirs and successors, declare by these presents that all and every persons being our subjects, which shall dwell and inhabit within every or any of the several colonies and plantations, and every one of their children, which shall happen to be born within any of the limits and precincts of the said several colonies and plantations, shall have and enjoy all liberties, franchises, and immunities within any of our other dominions, to all intents and purposes as if they had been abiding and born within this our realm of England, or any other of our said dominions. It was this principle, repeated in many later charters to the American colonies, which gave to English colonization one of its most distinctive characteristics. In the 16th and 17th centuries, the colonists of other countries were not privileged to enjoy the constitutional guarantees of the inhabitants of the colonizing states themselves. On the contrary, colonists were viewed as persons outside the constitutional and legal system of the home country itself. It may well be questioned, as already suggested, whether the solemn declaration of the principle by English sovereigns was essential to the valid extension of English laws and constitutional privileges to the colonists. Rather, it is true to say that the colonists who settled on territory claimed by England, and who recognized their allegiance to the English crown, carried with them, whether the king willed it or not, so much of the English constitutional and legal system as was applicable to their situation. The government of Plymouth rested throughout its history upon the Mayflower Compact, not upon royal charter. Penn's patent as proprietor in 1681, unlike the other colonial charters, contained no provision to the effect that the inhabitants of the colony should be deemed subjects of the crown, and as such entitled to all the liberties and immunities of Englishmen. But as the territory of the colony was claimed by England, and as the allegiance to the crown was reserved, it would seem clear that the colonists were subjects, and as such entitled to all the privileges of Englishmen. This, at any rate, was the opinion of the great Chalmers in regard to Penn's patent. But, whatever view we may hold upon this question, a solemn enunciation of the principle in royal charters furnished a solid documentary basis for the claim of the colonists that they possessed the rights of Englishmen. Royal charters were held by the colonists to be solemn compacts between the king and themselves, and these solemn compacts constituted the earliest written constitutions of the colonies. Embodied as they were in these fundamental instruments of government, their constitutional rights as Englishmen seemed to the colonists unassailable. Time and time again, in their struggles with colonial and imperial authorities, the colonists relied upon their charters as the documentary evidence, the written title of rights secured to them, as to all Englishmen, by Magna Carta, the Bill of Rights, and the general principles of the common law. The declaration of the royal charters thus acted as a powerful factor in the spread throughout the colonies 
of English constitutional principles, including the rights and liberties secured by Magna Carta and its confirmations. 3. There is another feature of the royal charters which deserves attention, their expressed declaration that the colonies may legislate for themselves, so long as the laws thus enacted conform to the English legal system. Thus, by way of example, the Massachusetts Charter of 1691 explicitly says, And we do further grant to the said governor and the great and general court full power and authority from time to time to make all manner of wholesome and reasonable orders, laws, statutes, and ordinances, directions and instructions, either with penalties or without, so as the same be not repugnant or contrary to the laws of this our realm of England, as they shall judge to be for the good and welfare of our said province." This grant of legislative power to the colonies produced important results not the least of which was the growth of a body of colonial statutory law adapted to the needs of the new English communities across the sea. Both in form and in substance, much of this written law of the colonies was a reenactment of the common and statutory law of England, and thus conformed to English legal traditions and to the requirements of the charters. On the other hand, the colonial legislatures introduced into their laws and codes many new features especially adapted to local conditions. Some of these features were archaic in character, while others, in their spirit of reform, were actually in advance of contemporary law in the mother country. In the Puritan colonies of New England, the law of God gave a peculiar color to the whole legal system, while in all the colonies, local customary law molded in important respects the decisions of the courts and the colonial legislation. Not all the resources of imperial control possessed by the Crown and Parliament could keep the growing American communities, with their novel conditions and special needs, within the strict confines of the legal system of the mother country. Incorporated in this statutory law of the colonies, were many principles of English constitutional law, derived from the decisions of English courts and from the great charters and statutes of English liberty. Of special interest to us in our present study is the embodiment of various rights and liberties of Magna Carta in the colonial written law. Even in the Puritan colonies of New England, which in theory based their earlier legal system upon the word of God, and which, in fact, of all the colonies, departed furthest from English judicial models, we find important features of Magna Carta placed in colonial legislative enactments. Indeed, in these and other vital respects, English common law formed a greater element in Puritan law than the Puritans themselves at the time suspected, and than even present-day students of the system, attracted by the frequent citation of scripture in decisions and statutes, are oftentimes aware. The laws of all the colonies deserve a long and detailed study, with special reference to their incorporation of the provisions of Magna Carta. But for our present purpose it must suffice to draw attention to illustrative instances of this process. In early Massachusetts, the struggle for written laws as opposed to the exercise of wide discretionary powers on the part of the executive and judicature, finally resulted in the enactment of the famous body of liberties. In the discussions that preceded this legislation, John Winthrop had argued, in his tract on arbitrary government, that it was unwise to place too great a restraint upon judges, who should decide cases in accordance with divine justice as revealed in the Bible, Still, even Winthrop admitted that for the purpose of restricting capital punishment and of making men's estates more secure against heavy fines, it would be well to have a general law like Magna Carta. The general position of the colonists was that their liberties were not safe from arbitrary power because these liberties were not embodied in positive law. Winthrop, in his History of New England, says... The deputies, having conceived great danger to our state, 
in regard that our magistrates for want of positive law in many cases might proceed according to their discretion it was agreed that some men should be appointed to frame a body of grounds of law in resemblance to a magna carta which being allowed by some of the ministers and the general court should be received for fundamental laws accordingly at the general court twenty fifth may sixteen thirty six it was ordered that a body of laws agreeable to the word of god to be the fundamentals of this commonwealth should be drawn up and submitted to the general court as a result of this action the body of liberties finally became the law of the colony in 1641 although the word of god figures prominently in this code the lawmakers seem also to have followed in some sections the model of magna carta and of the english common law thus for example in its first section the body of liberties echoes the spirit of chapter thirty nine of magna carta by declaring that no man's life shall be taken away no man's honor or good name shall be stained no man's person shall be arrested restrained banished dismembered nor any ways punished no man shall be deprived of his wife or children no man's goods or estate shall be taken away from him nor any way in damaged under color of law or countenance of authority unless it be by virtue or equity of some express law of the country warranting the same established by a general court and sufficiently published or in case of the defect of a law in any particular case by the word of god and in capital cases or in cases concerning dismembering or banishment according to that word to be judged by the general court in 1646 there arose an important controversy as to the constitutional guarantees of the body of liberties and other massachusetts laws which involved a careful examination of the provisions of magna carta by the colonists certain residents of the colony led by robert child discontented largely by reason of the religious policy of the colonial authorities addressed the general court declaring that a settled government in accordance with the laws of england did not appear to them to have been established and that they did not feel secure in the enjoyment of their lives liberties and estates as free-born english subjects they petitioned therefore for the establishment of the wholesome laws of england that they might thus be admitted to the liberties to which all free englishmen were accustomed both at home and in the colonies in their reply to the petitioners the general court compared at length the provisions of the body of liberties with those of magna carta and the principles of the common law the court maintained that this comparison demonstrated the fact that english and colonial laws were in agreement in all fundamental particulars and that indeed civil liberty in massachusetts under the body of liberties was as well protected as it was in england under magna carta and the common law the general court also sent in sixteen forty six an address to the long parliament in which it was declared that the government of the colony was framed in accordance with the colonial charter and the fundamental and common laws of england and conceived according to the same taking the words of eternal truth and righteousness along with them as that rule by which all kingdoms and jurisdictions must render account of every act and administration in the last day they then tried to prove the truth of their statement by setting forth in parallel columns the fundamental and common laws of england and the laws of the colony in this comparison magna carta was viewed by the general court as the chief embodiment of english common law connecticut following the example of massachusetts early enacted a law embodying fundamental rights and liberties and trial by jury together with other english institutions and practices became part of the colonial system so too in 1647 rhode island adopted a code of civil and criminal laws based in part upon english laws that were thought adapted to the needs of the colony prefixed to these laws was a reaffirmation of chapter thirty nine of magna carta 
prohibiting arbitrary arrests and punishments, and a declaration that by law of the land, lex terre, was meant the law enacted by the General Assembly of the colony itself, not the law of England, unless adopted by the Assembly as colonial law. The New York Charter of Liberties, of 1683, was the first statute enacted by the colonial legislature after the English conquest of Dutch New Netherlands. This statute, framed expressly for the colony by the Duke of York, secures a jury trial to all inhabitants of the colony, and contains many of the provisions of Magna Carta, the Petition of Right, and the Habeas Corpus Act. Although the Charter of Liberties never received the royal assent, because it savoured too strongly of popular freedom, and seemed to run counter to the Crown's prerogative and the legislative supremacy of Parliament, yet the colonists always claimed that it was operative in protection of their constitutional liberties. The Colonial Assembly of Maryland passed a bill in 1638 to recognize Magna Carta as a part of the law of the province. The Act expressly declared that the inhabitants shall have all their rights and liberties according to the Great Charter of England. The act was, however, disallowed by the king, because the Attorney General expressed himself as uncertain how far the enactment thereof will be agreeable to the constitution of this colony or consistent with the royal prerogative. In 1712, the colonial legislature of South Carolina, by special act, adopted the English common law as a rule of adjudicature, and also 126 English statutes, selected by Chief Justice Trott as applicable to colonial conditions. Included among the English statutes thus put in force by the colonial legislature were Magna Carta and the other great English statutes which declared the rights and liberties of the subject. The similar adoption of English common law and statutes was effected by the legislature of North Carolina in 1715. A striking illustration of the attention paid to Magna Carta by colonial lawmakers is found in the history of Virginia. In the middle of the 17th century, a sharp controversy arose in this colony, as elsewhere in America, in regard to lawyers. In 1756, certain colonial acts hostile to lawyers were repealed, but in the following year a proposition for the ejection of lawyers was carried. Thereupon a new act was passed by the legislature, forbidding any person to plead or give advice in any judicial proceedings for reward. The governor and council did not look with favor on this act, but they promise to give their assent to the measure so far as it shall be agreeable to Magna Carta. An examination of the terms of Magna Carta was then made by a committee, who reported that they failed to discover in them any prohibition of the colonial legislation in question. These, and other colonial acts and codes which might be instanced, prove that the colonial legislatures representing in general the wishes of the colonists as opposed to those of royal officials, embodied principles of English common law, including provisions of Magna Carta, the Bill of Rights, and other great constitutional statutes, in the written law of Englishmen within the overseas provinces. In general, colonial legislation, which is an important feature of the working of early American self-government, was subjected to imperial control by reason of the requirement that colonial acts must receive the assent of the crown, acting through the royal governors and the executive authorities in England, that the royal veto, which remained in full vigor in the relations of the crown to the colonies, long after its disuse in respect to acts of the English Parliament, was employed to safeguard the interests of the royal prerogative, is strikingly illustrated by the history of colonial acts which embodied Magna Carta and other English legal guarantees of the rights and liberties of the subject. Attention has already been drawn to the fact that the Maryland Act of 1638, enacting Magna Carta, was disallowed by the Crown because it might be inconsistent with the royal prerogative, 
and that the New York Charter of Liberties of 1683, embodying Magna Carta, the Petition of Right, and the Habeas Corpus Act, never received the royal assent. Similarly, Sir John Somers, by reason of the fear that it might prejudice the royal prerogative and the legislative supremacy of Parliament, advised the disallowance of the Massachusetts Habeas Corpus Act, on the ground that the right to that writ had never been conferred on the colonists by a king of England, and that the guarantee of a speedy trial in Magna Carta was inapplicable to the status of colonists. Various other acts of colonial legislatures, which merely repeated provisions of Magna Carta, were likewise vetoed by the Crown. Footnote Bancroft, in his History of the Colonization of the United States, remarks, If the declaratory acts by which every one of the colonies asserted their right to the privileges of Magna Carta, to the feudal liberty of taxation except with their own consent, were always disallowed by the Crown, it was done silently, and the strife on the power of Parliament to tax the colonies was certainly adjourned. End footnote. It is clear that the exercise of the royal veto, which always in theory and many times in practice, acted as a wholesome restraint upon unwise colonial legislation, and served to keep the law of the colonies in general harmony with English law, worked injustice to the colonists, and sought to deprive them of their rightful privileges and liberties as English subjects, including the guarantees of Magna Carta and other English constitutional statutes, the exercise of the royal veto, particularly when it encroached upon their rights and liberties as Englishmen, was irritating to the colonists, but proved in most, if not all cases, ineffective. By disregarding the royal veto, by enacting new measures essentially like the ones vetoed, and by other similar devices, the colonists practically nullified the royal prerogative of disallowance. Footnote the disregard of the royal veto by the colonists is an excellent illustration of the way in which Englishmen in America, following the example of their kinfolk at home, were acquiring a constitution by robbing the crown of its prerogatives. End footnote. In effect, therefore, much of the colonial legislation which incorporated the principles of Magna Carta and other constitutional features of the common law remained in force in the colonies. Indeed, the whole history of Magna Carta and English constitutional liberties, as incorporated in the acts and state papers of the later colonial period, the revolutionary epoch, and the early national era, proves the persistence of the legal guarantees of the English constitution in America. For the maintenance of what they viewed as the rights of all Englishmen, the colonists were not only willing to face the crown and parliament in constitutional struggles, but also in armed conflict. When the time of their independence came, the people still insisted, as we shall see later, on the incorporation of their fundamental rights and privileges in the federal and state constitutions, the parts of these instruments containing the Declaration of Rights being known as Bills of Rights. 4. It is worth noting that Magna Carta became a generic term, which included various documents of special constitutional significance. Attention has already been drawn to the fact that the Massachusetts Bill of Liberties of 1641 was framed, in Winthrop's words, in resemblance to a Magna Carta. The Act of the New York Legislature of 1683, which was known as the Charter of Liberties and Privileges, and the Pennsylvania Charter of Privileges, which was the fundamental law of the province from 1701 to 1776, and the most famous of all colonial constitutions, may also perhaps be reckoned in this category. The instructions issued by the Virginia Company in 1618 to Sir George Yardley as governor are known to Virginian writers as the Great Charter, and the term is said to be found also in some of the land grants. But while this document was undoubtedly of great importance in the constitutional development of the colony, it is perhaps going somewhat too far to liken it to a Magna Carta. 
The use of the term Great Charter is instructive, however, as showing the influence of Magna Carta upon legal terminology. Another illustration may be taken from the history of the Carolinas. In 1668, the proprietors of Northern Carolina authorized the governor to grant land on the same terms and conditions as those that prevailed in Virginia. The colonists always referred to the instrument containing this authorization as the great deed of grant and regarded it as a species of Magna Carta. A point of even greater importance for our present purpose is that constitutional documents granted by colonial proprietors sometimes contain the clauses of Magna Carta itself. Thus, for instance, in the constitutions granted by the proprietors of New Jersey and Pennsylvania in the latter part of the 17th century, careful provision is made for the protection of personal liberty and of property, and the familiar phrases of Magna Carta reappear. Footnote. As William Penn seems to have had a hand in the framing of all these documents which embody the phrases of Magna Carta, it is instructive to observe that in 1670, when he was indicted in an English court for being present at an unlawful and tumultuous assembly in Gracechurch Street, and there addressing the people in contempt of the king and of his law and against his peace, Penn claimed for himself the rights of Englishmen as set forth in Magna Carta and its confirmations. Penn's case may be studied in the sixth volume of Howell's State Trials, End footnote. As a result of the constitutional struggles in England during the 17th century, the Petition of Right and the Bill of Rights similarly served as models for colonial constitutional documents, while after the American Revolution, the Bill of Rights, in which fundamental civil rights and liberties are declared, takes its place, as already observed, as an established feature of the constitutions of the federal and state governments. Thus, the very names of Magna Carta and the Bill of Rights were transmitted to America through the influence of the English Constitution, and terminology in this case, as so often in the history of institutions and laws, masked no mere shadow, but the very flesh and blood of living rights. 5. Hitherto we have considered the embodiment of the principles of Magna Carta in the written law of the colonies, in royal charters, colonial laws and codes, and colonial documents of constitutional significance. A further question suggests itself in regard to the unwritten law of the colonies. Were the provisions of Magna Carta incorporated in case law? In a Massachusetts case of 1687, the defendant pleaded that Magna Carta and the statute law secure the subject's properties and estates. To this one of the judges replied, the rest of the court by silence assenting, We must not think the laws of England follow us to the ends of the earth. But such a judicial utterance is characteristic of the general attitude of Massachusetts and of the other Puritan colonies. Their legal system avowedly based on the law of God, contained many English features, but only in case they had been expressly adopted by the colonial authorities were they viewed as binding. It was but natural, therefore, for the Massachusetts judges to declare that they were not bound by Magna Carta itself, which, as a complete document, had never been adopted by the colony, but through the body of liberties, and possibly other colonial acts, certain provisions of Magna Carta were taken up into Massachusetts law. In general, we may say that principles of Magna Carta and the common law, actually adopted by the legislatures of the colonies as their own law, undoubtedly bound the colonial courts, unless such enactments had been effectively vetoed by the Crown. And in this connection, it should not be forgotten, as we have already observed, that the veto of the crown often proved of no avail in checking the growth of colonial statutory law, even though that law seemed to the crown to be infringing upon its prerogative. In colonies where Magna Carta was adopted as a complete instrument, and where the royal veto, if it was applied, proved ineffectual, 
it would seem that the courts must surely have applied its provisions in the cases that came before them. It has been impossible to examine the court records, many of them still in manuscript, from this point of view, but it may be supposed that their careful study would disclose many cases where the courts applied the colonial Magna Carta, if one may be allowed the term, just as they applied in general the principles of the colonial common law. It may well turn out on further research that in at least four distinct ways the courts embodied the principles of Magna Carta in colonial case law. First, in cases interpreting and applying colonial legislation, such as the Massachusetts Body of Liberties, the Rhode Island Code of 1647, and the New York Charter of Liberties of 1683, which contained certain provisions of Magna Carta. Secondly, in cases interpreting and applying colonial acts which adopted the whole text of Magna Carta. Thirdly, in cases decided under colonial acts which adopted the whole of the English common law as the rule of colonial adjudicature. Fourthly, and in general, in decisions of the many courts that were engaged, together with other institutions of the colonies, in adopting and adapting, either consciously or unconsciously, such portions of the English law as best suited the legal requirements of the colonial communities. This view that colonial case law will be found on examination to embody principles of Magna Carta is strengthened by the well-known fact that in judicial proceedings of the period parties frequently claimed the rights of every freeborn English subject. 6. There is abundant evidence that in the political and constitutional controversy of the colonial period, the rights of the colonists as Englishmen played a vitally important part. In these disputes, Magna Carta and other English statutory guarantees of the subject were relied upon as the source of political privilege and civil right. An illustration of this is to be found in the Dyer Affair in New York, during the governorship of Edmund Andros. Complaints as to the administration of Andros, and even suggestions that New York officials had been guilty of peculation and extravagance, resulted in the Duke of York's summons to Andros in 1680, to return to England for the purpose of rendering an account of his doings. Before his departure from the colony, Andros had neglected to renew the customs duties. Learning that the duties had thus legally expired, colonial merchants declined to pay the imposts which the Duke's collector, William Dyer, continued to levy. Having seized a vessel and her cargo, Dyer was successfully sued by the owner for unlawfully detaining property which was not his own, and he was also indicted for high treason, the indictment charging him with having contrived innovations in government, and the subversion and change of the known ancient and fundamental laws of the realm of England, contrary to the great charter of liberties, contrary to the petition of right, and contrary to other statutes in these cases made and provided. On appealing his case to England, Dyer was successful there, and Andros also exculpated himself. Despite all this, however, the colonists still refused to pay the duties levied on the authority of James. Channing, in his History of the United States, has drawn attention to the fact that this movement was the first colonial rebellion against taxation from England, and that the words of Dyer's indictment carry one backward to the times of the Puritan rebellion in England, and forward to the days of Otis, Henry, and Dickinson in America. Looked at from the point of view of the rights of Englishmen away from home, the Dyer case is a striking instance of the colonists' dependence upon Magna Carta as the bulwark of their liberties. A further illustration may be taken from the history of Massachusetts. In this, as in other colonies, questions in regard to the governor's salary loom large in the political controversy of the times. The Assembly of Massachusetts insisted on making temporary salary grants, thinking by this means to secure a real control over the governor's actions. The governor's contention, on the other hand, 
was that permanent provision should be made for his salary, thus ensuring his free judgment in matters of legislation, on the analogy of English provision for the Crown by a permanent civil list. In one of Governor Burnett's messages to the Assembly in 1728 in regard to the salary question, he drew their attention to the provision in the colonial charter that they were to pass wholesome and reasonable laws which were not harmful to the English Constitution. The members of the Assembly caught up this reference to the Charter, and contended that the Governor himself had thus admitted that they possessed the rights of Englishmen. In support of their contention, they then proceeded to trace their rights as Englishmen, not only to the English legislation of the Stuart and Tudor periods, but also to the English Constitution in the time of Edward I and Henry III, and even to Magna Carta itself. The exciting events that followed did not result in a settlement of the controversy in Burnett's time, and only under his successor, Belcher, was it finally arranged that the governor, with the consent of the English government, should receive an annual grant, to be voted at the beginning and not at the end of the sessions of the Assembly. The course of this controversy thus forms an interesting chapter in the history of Magna Carta as the foundation of colonial rights, in opposition to the claims of the Crown and of royal governors. 7. The importation from England, as well as the colonial publication, of English statutes and documents, law reports and juristic treatises, diffused, especially in the 18th century, a knowledge of the common and statutory law, and thus acted as a very considerable factor in the extension of its principles, including the principles of Magna Carta and the English Constitution, throughout the colonies. Footnote. Nearly all the law books of the colonists were imported from England. Only 33 were printed in America before 1776. End footnote. Prominent among the books in the hands of the colonists were those dealing with the rights and liberties of Englishmen. Thus, among the first seven books printed in the colonies were Hall's The Englishman's Rights, 1693, Pettit's Lex Parliamentaria, 1716, Summers's The Security of Englishmen's Lives, 1720, and the fifth edition of Henry Kerr's English Liberties or the Freeborn Subjects' Inheritance, 1721, the last of which contained Magna Carta, the Petition of Right, the Habeas Corpus Act, and various other English statutes, as well as some of the leading English constitutional decisions, and a general account of the liberties of the subject, trial by jury, and other constitutional matters both in public and in private libraries, were to be found copies of yearbooks, English reports, Magna Carta and collections of English statutes, and the classics of English literature, such as the works of Glanville, Britton, Fortescue, Prynne, Bacon, Selden, Cook, Plowden, Hale, and Blackstone. In this way, the printed text of Magna Carta and the commentaries of the English jurists upon that text played their own special part in the legal education of the colonists, and thus in their adherence to the Charter's principles of constitutional liberty. One or two interesting facts will illuminate this textual power. Thus, in 1647, the governor and assistants of Massachusetts ordered the importation of two copies each of Cook on Magna Carta and various other books of English law, to the end that we may have better light for making and proceeding about laws. As early as 1687, William Penn published at Philadelphia an edition of Magna Carta, the confirmation of the charters, and the so-called statute de talagio non condescendo, accompanied by an address to the reader wherein the colonists were exhorted not to give away anything of liberty and property that at present they do enjoy, but take up the good example of our ancestors, and understand that it is easy to part with or give away great privileges, but hard to be gained if once lost. As a silent teacher of English notions of liberty, not only in Massachusetts and Pennsylvania, 
but in the other colonies as well, the printed text of the Charter exerted its own unique influence upon the legal and political ideas and the actual institutions of the Americans. 8. Throughout the colonies there existed a deep distrust of the legal profession. Most of the colonial judges were laymen, and there was much colonial legislation hostile to lawyers as a class. In the course of the 18th century, however, the legal profession, many of its members trained in the English inns of court and in American colleges, began to take a more prominent part in colonial affairs. During the revolutionary epoch, lawyers played a leading role in political and constitutional controversy, while in the early days of independence, when the federal and state constitutions were drafted and adopted, and the laws and institutions of the youthful republic were molded to fit the new conditions, some of the foremost statesmen and judges were lawyers of high distinction. The rise of a legal profession introduced a new and powerful factor in the growth of American legal ideas. Learned in the principles of English common law and in English constitutional ideas and practices, the early American lawyers exerted a professional and legal influence upon American development, and their share in the work of incorporating the principles of Magna Carta in colonial and revolutionary documents and in the constitutions of the federal era must have been considerable. Without pursuing this special topic further, in the present connection, we may yet note in a general way the services of the early American lawyers in the cause of the rights and liberties of the people. Warren, in his History of the American Bar, expresses the main point in these words. The influence on the American Bar of these English-bred lawyers was most potent. The training which they received in the inns, confined almost exclusively to the common law, based as it was on historical precedent and customary law, the habits which they formed there of solving all legal questions by the standards of English liberties and of the rights of the English subject, proved of immense value to them when they became, later, as so many did become, leaders of the American Revolution. Again, in another place, Warren remarks, the services rendered by the legal profession in the defense and maintenance of the people's rights and liberties, from the middle of the 18th century to the adoption of the Constitution, had been well recognized by the people in making a choice of their representatives. For of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence, 25 were lawyers. And of the 55 members of the Federal Constitutional Convention, 31 were lawyers, of whom four had studied in the Inner Temple, and one at Oxford under Blackstone. In the First Congress, ten of the twenty-nine senators and seventeen of the sixty-five representatives were lawyers. End of Section 12